Hi, and you're now with the Forerunner Chronicles. All right, everybody, I'd like to welcome you to part three of the special Forerunner Chronicles series entitled The Formation of a New World Order. And we have an amazing amount of information to go through in the next few minutes. So without any further ado, take a look. What you are now looking at is technology that has been developed by the military industrial complex to assist our military in seeking out individuals that have been defined by our government as violent extremists, enemy combatants, or terrorists. This device is called Big Dog. It is equipped to carry a 200 plus pound payload and it is also fully equipped with a fully automatic 45 caliber rifle. It can climb mountains, walk through snow. It has the balance of a ballerina. And this device has been developed for solely one purpose, to seek out and neutralize violent extremists, enemy combatants, terrorists. Now, look closely. It looks like a pigeon, but it's really a surveillance device. This is an MAV, a micro air vehicle. It's drone technology that has been developed by the military industrial complex for urban applications. This one obviously was made to simulate the look and the flight pattern of a bird to carry out covert surveillance of possible violent extremists, enemy combatants, or homegrown terrorists within the United States. And not only have they developed this technology to look like birds, but they've made it to look like the common housefly and many other insects. Once again, this technology has been developed to seek out and even to destroy enemy combatants, violent extremists, or terrorists because they are equipped with explosives so that they can attach themselves to their target and self-destruct, thereby neutralizing their target. Here is some video footage of an actual flight test of a nano hummingbird drone that is being used in real life applications. And this is a picture of an insect drone that has even now been sighted in large urban areas of the United States of America. Now you may be wondering why I'm showing you all of this technology that's been developed to seek out violent extremists, enemy combatants, or terrorists. Well, here's the reason why. In April of 2009, the Department of Homeland Security began to release reports on right-wing extremism and the resurgence of radicalization and recruitment. In layman's terms, these reports were dealing with the return and the growth of homegrown terrorism, violent extremists here in the United States of America. And amongst this list of different ideas or philosophies that people could believe in and teach that would make them possible violent extremists, possible terrorist threats to the United States government, they listed those that teach and believe apocalyptic prophecies. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's frightening to me. Because the books of Daniel and Revelation, which are found within the Bible, are the primary apocalyptic prophetic books that are found within the Holy Word of God. And Jesus Christ himself, in the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 3 said, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Jesus himself has pronounced a blessing on those that read hear and obey the prophecies found within these books. However, the United States government is beginning to marginalize on an increasing basis those who will uphold those teachings. That's terrifying to me. That's frightening to me to know that the government of the United States of America is beginning to look upon Bible prophecy as something that can be threatening to the sovereignty of our nation. But ladies and gentlemen, I praise God that we need not be surprised by all of these things because Jesus Christ himself already forewarned us that these events would come to pass. He told us with his very own mouth in the book of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and they shall kill you 
and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And when Jesus Christ identified a group of people living in the last days that will be hated by all nations for his name's sake, he wasn't simply talking about individuals that profess with their mouths to be Christians. He wasn't talking about people that profess with their tongues to be servants of Jesus Christ. No, Jesus wasn't talking about these types of individuals. On the contrary, as you learned in part one of this series, according to the book of Exodus chapter 34 verses 5, 6, and 7, and Exodus chapter 20 verses 5 and 6, and James chapter 2 verse 10, and Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, to be hated for his name's sake means that God will have a people that will have faith in the power of Jesus Christ to give them the ability to obey all ten of his commandments, including the fourth commandment, which is the seventh day Sabbath commandment. You need to take a look at that. That's in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. And because the commandments are a transcript of the character of God, these individuals by faith in Jesus Christ will reveal the character of God. And because men love darkness rather than light, they will hate you because the light of the world, Jesus Christ, will be reigning in your heart. That is what the Bible is talking about there. And this event is getting ready to come to pass in the very near future. But the question which now stands before us, glaring us in the face, is how close are we really till the time in which the nations of our world will unite to make war against God's people, to persecute the commandment-keeping people of God. Well, we began to unfold this mystery in part two of this series when we looked at in detail the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2. But before we looked at that prophecy of Daniel chapter 2, we looked at a very important prophetic principle found within the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 15 that I would have us revisit now because it will help us be able to clearly understand what God is getting ready to reveal to us. We are told in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 15, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. In other words, the things that took place in the past, they're taking place in our present day society, and the things that will transpire in the near future, they have already, at least in principle, taken place in the past. Therefore, God requires of us to have a knowledge of historic events, especially those historic events that have impacted the progress of God's church throughout history so that we can better understand what's going on right now in our current society and have a good idea of what's getting ready to unfold in the very near future. Now, in our previous study of Daniel chapter 2, we looked at the historic account of a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. At that point in history, Nebuchadnezzar was the ruler of the worldwide dominion known as Babylon. And in part two of this series, we learned that God gave Nebuchadnezzar a prophetic dream. In this dream, Nebuchadnezzar saw an image that had a head of gold, its breast and arms were made up of silver, its belly and thighs were made up of brass, its legs were made up of iron, and its feet were made up of two materials, iron and clay. Then Nebuchadnezzar saw a stone that was cut out without hands that came and smote the image upon its feet that consisted of iron and clay, but it broke the whole image into pieces. And then the wind carried those pieces away. And the stone which smote the image, it became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The Bible gives us this information in Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 through 36. And then Daniel the prophet gave Nebuchadnezzar an interpretation of what that image was symbolic of. In Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 38, Daniel the prophet revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar that his kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon, was symbolized by that head of gold, and that the breast and arms of silver were symbolic of another kingdom that would come up into existence after the fall of Babylon. And according to Daniel chapter 5, verses 25 through 28, that kingdom was the Medes and the Persians. They symbolized the breast and arms of silver. 
and the belly and thighs of brass were actually symbolic of another kingdom that would come up into existence after the reign of the Medes and the Persians. And according to a prophetic vision that Daniel the prophet received in Daniel chapter 8, when we look at verses 20 and 21, the Bible shows us clearly that it was the kingdom of Greece that overthrew the Medes and the Persians to rule over the entire then known world at that point in history, symbolized by the belly and thighs of brass. And then we quickly went to history and saw that it was the pagan Roman Empire that began to rule over the then known world after Greece. Therefore, the pagan Roman Empire is symbolized in that image by the legs of iron, which brings us now to the feet that consist of iron and clay, which I told you in part two of this series that we would spend more time in detail on at this time. And so we're going to do this as we go to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41, the Bible tells us, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But in it shall be of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Now, we learned earlier that the iron is a symbol of the pagan Roman Empire in this prophecy. But what is this potter's clay symbolic of? Well, the Bible begins to answer this inquiry in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18 and verse 6. We are told there, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord God, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. Notice clearly that God is likening the house of Israel unto the clay that the potter would have in his hand. And what type of clay does a potter have in his hand? Potter's clay. And the house of Israel is just another title for the children of Israel. Matter of fact, the house of Israel are the people of God according to the Bible. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 30, the Bible tells us at the very end of that verse, even the house of Israel are my people, saith the Lord God. But now let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8, because there the children of Israel say, And now, O Lord, thou art our father, and we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the works of thine hands. Here clearly, now the children of Israel, whom are the house of Israel, or God's people, they're saying, God, you're our potter, we're the clay, mold us and fashion us, we are the potter's clay. Once again, the house of Israel, the children of Israel, God's people are likened unto potter's clay. But did you know the Bible has another title for the children of Israel, whom are the house of Israel, whom are the people of God? That title is found within the book of Acts, chapter 7, beginning at verse 37. We are told there, this is that Moses that said to the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Notice the Bible called the children of Israel God's church. This is because God's people throughout all ages always make up God's church. And if God's church is symbolized by the children of Israel or his people, that means the potter's clay is a symbol of the people of God or of God's church. 